Vor bald einem Jahr ist die russische Armee in der Ukraine einmarschiert. Der Krieg beschäftigt uns alle und bringt gigantisches Leid über unschuldige Menschen. Einer, dessen Analysen zurzeit besonders gefragt sind, ist Ivan Krastev. Er sagt, bedroht sind nicht allein Menschen und Landesgrenzen, sondern die Idee des Liberalismus. Ist unsere Freiheit zu retten? Und wie? Ja, vor zwei Wochen haben Sie in der Financial Times geschrieben, wir denken normalerweise, Kriege endeten auf Schlachtfeldern oder an Verhandlungstischen. Sie aber sagen, nein, Kriege enden meist an Wahlurnen. Wie kommen Sie darauf? So, and this is an interesting story. If you look at the last 30, 40 years, you see that basically war between states have been very much replaced by the civil wars and kind of things within states. And you're not going to see many peace treaties being signed recently. Mm -hmm. uh, in a strange way, the wars don't end, they die. And they're dying very much for different reasons, but one of the places where they die very much is in the ballot boxes. Go back to the United States war in Vietnam. It ended basically with the American public changing their view with the elections. Go to the French war in Algeria. Uh, go to the Balkan Wars. In a certain way, it was the vote of the Serbs in 2000 to vote Milosevic out that ended the war. So when I was trying to say that the wars now end in the ballot boxes, my idea was that probably the best way to see the war in 2023 is not just to try to project the trends of 2022, but to try to see it from some critical elections that are going to take place in 2024. Und solche Wahlen finden zum Beispiel auch im Frühling in Russland und in der Ukraine statt, 2024. Das bedeutet ja eigentlich, dass Putin auf jeden Fall gewinnen muss, sonst verliert er die Wahlen. Und auch Zelensky darf keine Zugeständnisse machen, sonst ist auch er gefährdet. Was wird passieren? No, this is, this is exactly, and listen, this is a war, so many things can happen. And Everybody who is trying to pretend that he or she knows mm -hmm. how and the war and when wars are ending basically is normally wrong. But we know something very important. Uh, President Putin, for six months, has been living with a totally false idea that there is a special operation going in Ukraine. And in September, he cannot even lie to himself that it was a special operation. So he went with the mobilization, and obviously now the mobilization is spreading. So this kind of a special operation was over. The war has started. Uh, but then now he's facing a criticism from two different sides. Those, many of them left Russia who said, why do you start this war? And those, some of them staying in Russia who said, why are you not winning this war? And from this point of view, regardless of the fact that Russians are known for not electing or choosing their presidents and their parents, uh, this election campaign is going to be critically important for Putin to the extent that there are voices within Russia that he decided not to hmm. run. Und interessanterweise sagen Sie in diesem Beitrag in der Financial Times ja auch, es geht nicht nur um die Wahlurnen in der Ukraine oder in Russland, sondern es geht auch sehr viel weiter um die Wahlurnen in Europa und in den USA. Um mal die USA zu nehmen, auch da Wahlen 2024. Es ist völlig klar, wenn Russland siegt, wird das aufs Konto der Republikaner einzahlen. Umgekehrt braucht eigentlich Zelensky die Kraft der US-Demokraten, weil sie den Krieg in der Ukraine unterstützen mit Waffen, also die ukrainische Seite unterstützen. Das heißt, im Grunde genommen, früher dachten wir, es geht in Kriegen, wenn wir von außen drauf blicken, um Handelsbeziehungen, vielleicht noch um Waffenlieferungen. Heute geht es um diese politischen Bewegungen, um Wahlen weltweit gesehen. Totally. Uh, listen, the war changed a lot of things. And uh, our generation, at least my generation, we were not prepared to see the reality that you have a major war going on in Europe. This is not a local conflict. The number of shells that are now fired in Ukraine on both sides is on the level of 1941. And as a result of it, all these politicians, and listen, when we say elections, this is not an ordinary elections. In the United States, both for the Democrats and for the Republicans, they see it as a critical elections. Many people on both sides believe that they're going to lose these elections, they're losing their country. So you know that the war is going to be instrumentalized. Mm 
So from this point of view, nevertheless, who is going to be the Republican candidate, I can easily see that he's going to say it is a Putin's war, but it's also a Biden's war. So President Biden is very important. The Ukrainians, to do what they're doing now, succeed and convince the people that basically they're going to win. On the other side, it's very important for the American public to know that the world is not moving to the World War III. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a result, it's important. And even the elections in Taiwan, which is so far away from Ukraine, are going to be critical. Because if you're going to have a very strong nationalistic campaign and pro-independence candidate who is going very much to shape this debate, we don't know how this is going to change also the timing and the strategy of the Chinese government with respect to the island. So we are living in a world in which elections and wars kind of have been so much interdependent and intersected that basically ballots and bullets mm -hmm. uh, are playing this strange dance in reshaping this kind of a new reality. Und das macht die Situation ja auch wahnsinnig ungemütlich, weil man den Eindruck bekommt, wir alle hängen da irgendwie mit drin. Es geht um die Zersetzung des Liberalismus in ganz vielen Staaten, wenn nicht überhaupt rund um den Globus. Darüber werden wir später auch noch sprechen. Wenn wir mal die Zeit zurückdrehen, muss man ja sagen, viele reiben sich nach wie vor die Augen. Für mich ist so etwas vom, vom Eindrücklichsten, diese, ähm, diese Geschichte von Tony Chatt, der 1989 am Wiener Bahnhof stand und diese Züge ankommen hat sehen mit den vielen Menschen aus diesen Ländern, die geflohen sind. Und er gedacht hat, ich schreibe eine neue Geschichte Europas mit dem Titel «Post War». Und jetzt stehen wir da mit diesem Krieg der eben sehr viel mehr ist als ein lokaler Konflikt, wie Sie sagen. Was würden Sie im Nachhinein sagen? Waren wir komplett naiv? Oder war Tony Chat naiv? Listen, it's great that you're bringing Tony Chat and, uh, uh, and the book. And when I was, uh, when the war started, like many others, I was on the, uh, in the railway station uh, in Vienna, seeing against people coming. But this time it was not people who are coming because the borders has been open, but it was the Ukrainian refugees coming out of the war. And it was not by accident that Tony Judd called his great history of Europe in the second half of the 20th century post-war, because Europe was post-war in two different senses. First, it was the post-war because Europe was very much born out of the experience of the World War II. Uh, but secondly, because Europe was a project based uh, on the assumptions that a major war is not possible in Europe anymore. Not in the world. From this point of view, neither Tony Judd, not most of the European leaders, was so naive to believe that the war cannot happen anywhere else. But the idea was that the war was not going to happen in Europe anymore. And this is why what happened, and with the Russian invasion in Ukraine, it was not simply that the war started, but it forced Europe to re-examine some of the major assumptions mm -hmm. on which the European project was built. For example, Europeans believed, for good reasons, that economic interdependence, that the fact that countries are trading with each other, making the war impossible. So when the Germans are asking for the Nord Stream 1 or Nord Stream 2, it was not simply a commercial project. They believe that they're buying so much gas out of Russia that the Russians are never going to start a war. This is Wandel durch Handel. Absolutely. And this is what has worked for the previous years. And then suddenly you discover that what you see as source of security is becoming source of insecurity. Suddenly you see basically this same gas being weaponized. Und warum haben die uns darin getäuscht? Warum funktioniert Wandel durch Handel nicht? Listen, what is interesting is, of course, we are not kind of a, pff, deceiving ourselves for the first time. This is normal in human experience to universalize what worked. Listen, don't forget, in 1913, the idea that when states trade with each other, they are not going to fight each other, was so popular that the best book, uh, best-selling book, was written on it. Uh, but also for the Europeans, it was much more radical project because also Europe has managed to convince itself that military power does not work. When basically Europeans were watching the Americans after Iraq and Afghanistan, they said, "We know something that others don't know." And this is important about Europe. Listen, the history of Europe has changed. In the beginning of the 20th century, European order was the world order. Basically, the world was run by European empires. And then came the Cold War. And of course, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union have been a classical European powers, but Europe was the major theater of confrontation. Everything was about Berlin. 
And then came the end of the Cold War, and Europeans said, okay, probably we're even not the most important place. We're not running the world, but we're the laboratory of the world to come. Mm. What we are doing is what others are going to realize is how these things worked. And from this point of view, when the Germans declared that they're going to invest 100 billion euro in their defense capabilities, this is not a policy change. It is an identity change. The war forced all of us to see the world with different eyes. Und das ist ja auch einer Ihrer ganz ähm, wichtigen Punkte, dass Sie sagen, wir haben eigentlich einen Deutungsfehler gemacht. Wir haben immer auf diesen Konflikt in der Ukraine geblickt, aus der Linse heraus, aus der Perspektive heraus des Kalten Krieges. Aber in Tat und Wahrheit ja. ist es ein Krieg um Identität. Das ist eigentlich Ihre, ja. Ihre eigentlich wichtige, zentrale These zurzeit. Ja. Yeah, totally. Listen, uh, for many people, particularly in the United States, uh, this is simply the return of the Cold War. And of course, you have a democratic country in the case of Ukraine and you have an authoritarian regime in Russia. But this is very much about the identity war. And as a result of it, what basically President Putin did when he wrote this uh, infamous essay that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, he basically said it's not up to the Ukrainians to decide who they are. I know better who they are because I have read the archives. And now when basically the Ukrainians are saying Russia was always imperialistic and basically this is in their DNA, also the Ukrainians are saying you, for many years you allowed Russians to tell you who are the Ukrainians and now it's up to us to tell you who are the Russians. So from this point of view we see the rise of the identity politics on the international level. Before we had been discussing all identity politics very much in domestic politics, uh, uh, when it comes to the domestic politics, but now you see that countries are fighting each other in order to force others to see them in the way they're seeing themselves. Und das eine ist sozusagen diese Identitätsfrage eines gemeinsamen Zarenreiches, sagen wir jetzt mal, eines gemeinsamen russischen Großreiches. Das andere sind natürlich auch noch ganz andere Identitätsfragen. Sie sagen, Putin hat geradezu eine Identitätspanik, er will etwas verteidigen und das hat auch mit kulturellen Werten ähm, zu tun. Er denkt zum Beispiel, wir brauchen ganz strikte Ordnungen, wir brauchen territoriale Grenzen, die klar gezogen sind, aber wir brauchen auch klare Geschlechtergrenzen ja. zum Beispiel, wir brauchen klare ähm, Geschlechterordnungen. Er ist eigentlich im Grunde genommen panisch vor dieser Idee der Fluidität Dort. zwischen Geschlechtern, zwischen Rollenbildern, aber auch eben zwischen Staaten. Ja, yeah, totally. Listen, normally when we talk about changes, people moving, we believe that one of the major stories is that you cannot make others like you. But the other fear is that others can change us. Nobody can understand what... Uh, Putin and his government is doing if it's not going to look at these two or three things that are so strange that if you're not going to understand them, you're not going to understand anything. For example, this massive kidnapping of Ukrainian kids and orphans and the decision of the Russian parliament that they can be on a fast track adopted uh, by uh, the Russian families. There is a major demographic fears behind the Russia's behavior. As you know, like many East European countries, uh, demographically Russia is shrinking, losing population. One million excess deaths, even only COVID. So for President Putin, Ukrainians should be Russians because there are not enough Russians in the world. Zumal Sie haben jetzt Covid erwähnt, mit yeah. einer Million yeah. Todesopfer, aber es gibt auch immer mehr Land, das auftaut. Das heißt, Russland wird eigentlich größer, wenn man so will, weil mehr Landfläche vorhanden ist. Es gibt natürlich auch Einwanderer, Total. aber das sind nicht die Slaven sozusagen, yeah. die eben Putin Total. will. This is one aspect and this is this demographic panic. Mm -hmm. There are not going to be enough of us. Three, in the three months before the war, on several occasions, Russian president, without being asked, was saying that the famous Russian scientists in the 19th century, Mendeleev, predicted that in year 2000 there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world. And he said now they're only 150. But the other part which you see very much is at the center of this war is a clash between generations. Listen, in a certain way, the war between Russia and Ukraine is the war between the last Soviet generation. Darf ich ganz kurz äh, Sie unterbrechen? Sie haben mir auch erzählt, dass Sie einen Popstar, einen Rockstar getroffen haben, oder? Yeah. Der genau gesagt yeah. hat, sozusagen, yeah. er ist aus einer jungen Generation und er hat den Eindruck, er wird nicht mehr gehört in Russland. Uh, listen, this is the major story. Who governs the country? Just look at the governments. Uh, basically, President Putin is the last uh, uh, Soviet generation. So from this point of view, he is not so, so kind of uh, uh, surprising that he is very much interested in orphans because he himself is the orphan of the Soviet Union. 
Uh, uh, on the other side, basically, Zelensky is the post-Soviet generation. Uh, and what happened in Russia is that the young people never managed to get to power. And this is why they're so easily leaving the country. Because of many changes, and as you know, Ukraine has a problem with its own. This was a corrupt, dysfunctional place before the war. But the generation change took place. And now you have the problem of the Russian elites. And this is not a problem about democracy. This is a problem about social values. So you have all these Russians who made money in the 1990s, and they sent their kids to study abroad, coming to Switzerland, going to London. And these kids are coming back, and they have a totally different views on the problem of sexual orientation on a modern family. So it's not about Putin. This is about what it means to be a modern person. And this idea that the West has kidnapped our kids. Do you remember how the kind of the war of Russia on the West was declared? It was declared in 2012, when basically the Russian government adopted so-called Dima Yakovlev legislation, banning the possibility of the Americans to adopt Russian orphans. This idea is that the West is taking our kids. Our kids are not our kids anymore because we don't understand them. We don't understand their values. We don't understand what they're talking about. This kind of a major generational divide is something that basically President Putin decided to solve by starting a war that should have created a new Russian identity. And basically, paradoxically, this idea we're going to get these kids because otherwise the West is going to take our kids and we're not going to recognize them anymore. So you're never going to understand what is happening in Russia if you're not going to understand this identity panic, which is very typical for a certain generation. By the way, the generation that was genuinely shattered by the events. For the Russians, the disintegration of the Soviet Union is something very different than the end of communism. Many of them didn't feel sorry for communism collapsing, but Soviet Union was their country. Mm -hmm. Hören wir ihm doch mal kurz zu, diesem Wladimir Putin, denn um seine Identity Panics, diese Panik überhaupt irgendwie ähm, zu verstehen, müssen wir, glaube ich, auch verstehen, wie er auch über den Westen beispielsweise denkt, wie sehr Putin den Westen verachtet und gleichzeitig Russland glorifiziert. Das wurde überdeutlich auch in seiner Rede zur Teilmobilmachung der Streitkräfte am 21. September 2022. Wir hören ganz kurz zu. Das Ziel des Westens ist es, unser Land zu schwächen, zu spalten und letztlich zu zerstören. Sie sagen ganz offen, dass es ihnen 1991 gelungen sei, die Sowjetunion zu spalten und dass es nun an der Zeit sei, dass Russland selbst in eine Vielzahl von Regionen und Gebieten zerfällt, die tödlich miteinander verfeindet sind. Sie haben die totale Russophobie zu ihrer Waffe gemacht und jahrzehntelang gezielt den Hass auf Russland geschürt, vor allem in der Ukraine, für die sie das Schicksal eines antirussischen Brückenkopfes vorgesehen haben. Und sie haben das ukrainische Volk zu Kanonenfutter gemacht und es in den Krieg mit unserem Land getrieben. Sie setzen die Armee gegen die Zivilbevölkerung ein und organisieren einen Völkermord, eine Blockade und Terror gegen diejenigen, die sich weigern, die Regierung anzuerkennen, die in der Ukraine durch einen Staatsstreich an die Macht gekommen ist. Der Westen organisiere einen Völkermord. Inwiefern glaubt Putin selbst, was er sagt? I do believe he believes 100 percent of what he's saying. And this is the interesting story about Putin, because he comes from the intelligence services. We always believe that he's very deceptive, that he's very cynical. But uh, for the last 10 years at least, obviously President Putin was much more talking to himself. Listen, being in power in a highly authoritative regime for such a long time, is changing people. And I was remember recently uh, some of his very uh, uh, close aides on the question who is really advising President Putin his days. He said he has only three important advisors, Peter the Great, Ekaterina the Great, and Ivan the Terrible. So he's living in a different time. He believes what he's saying. And part of the story to understand why he believes what he's saying is Go back to history. In 1989, 1990, when the world was changing, when basically Soviet Union was starting to disintegrate, he was a middle-level intelligence officer outside of his country. He was staying in East Germany, and he could not understand how a nuclear superpower can collapse overnight. 
And this, the mystery of the Soviet disintegration, and keep in mind, when you are not living in your country and your country is changing dramatically, it's very different to understand what is going on. So because you don't understand, you come with the idea of the conspiracy. Historically speaking, by the way, the Americans were very afraid of the disintegration of the Soviet Union to the extent that in 1991, American President Bush Sr. went to Kiev asking Ukrainians not to vote for independence. These things are now lost because basically we are not interested what happened very much in the past. But for Putin, he never managed to understand why and how the Soviet mm. Union collapsed. And as a result of it, he adopted this police view of history where everything is conspiracy, nothing is, is accidental, and there is always a kind of a major mm. center. There is a headquarters that is running it. And das ist ja interessant übrigens, das findet man schon bei Immanuel Kant, diese Vorstellung, dass manchmal die Sehnsucht danach, alles zu verstehen, zur rasenden Vernunft wird. Also zu einer Vernunft, die über sich hinausschlägt, Purzelbäume schlägt und eigentlich in den Wahnsinn abdriftet. Sie haben Putin ja auch einmal persönlich kennengelernt, Sie wurden eingeladen an ein Abendessen ja, ja, mit ihm. Ja. Was haben Sie für eine Erinnerung an diese Persönlichkeit? Hat er Ihnen die Hand gegeben? Ist er jemand, der einen umarmt? Oder was ist er für eine Persönlichkeit? Listen, he's a very intensive person. He could be very angry. Uh, uh, we are talking about somebody who basically has the feeling of a very strong historical mission for himself. But because we have been discussing, it was just after Crimea, very much what was happening in Ukraine. For example, for Putin, when he sees, nevertheless, way in the world, 20,000 people on the street, he's never asking why they're there. He's always asking who is sending them there, mm -hmm. who is behind this. And this type of a very strong conspiracy idea of history is really rooted in this kind of not understanding why Soviet Union has disintegrated. And this is why, this is by the way, people are saying that he wants to restore Soviet Union. This is not true. His project is totally different. It's much more ethnic, uh, 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 Russian Empire. When he recognized uh, the Donetsk and Lugansk republics in February 2022, two days before the war, this was one of the most violent anti-Soviet speeches, saying that Ukraine is a country created by Lenin and now run by Nazism. But, and this is important, going back to your question about post-war and Tony Judd. One of the things that was destroyed in this war is the common reference to the World War II. During the Cold War, any moment when basically the West and Soviet Union didn't know what to talk about, you talk about the common victory in the World War II. And now this is the end. Because for the Ukrainians, seeing their destructive Uh, city, seeing basically the Russians killing people in Bucha and others, for them, this is the Nazis coming. Mm. At the same time, the Russian government basically is trying to justify all its actions, saying the Nazis are rattling Kiev. From this point of view, there is no any more common reference between Russia and the West when it comes to the World War II. Mm. And uh, not simply that the war came back, what Tony was don't expecting, but also suddenly the war that created Europe mm. does not exist in the way it existed before in the memories of the people. Eine wichtige Strategie von Putin ist ja auch immer wieder, dem Westen Scheinheiligkeit vorzuwerfen und zu sagen, ihr sagt mir, ich kolonialisiere die Ukraine, was habt ihr getan? Ihr wart die großen Kolonialherren. Oder beispielsweise auch eigentlich vielleicht etwas vom Zynischsten überhaupt. Sie machen in einem äh, Aufsatz auch den Vergleich mit diesen Bildern. Putin hat im Grunde genommen in Kiew einen Fernsehturm angegriffen, genauso wie damals die NATO ähm, äh, in 1999 Belgrad angegriffen hat. Und das, sagen Sie, ist eigentlich kein Zufall. Das ist eine Ikonografie, die diese Scheinheiligkeit des Westens anprangern soll. No, listen, the hypocrisy of the West is real. Many times the West is doing one, saying one thing and doing others. So from this point of view, uh, uh, one of the idea of the hypocrisy of the West is obsession not only for President Putin, but basically to almost anybody outside of the West. But what he was doing is something different. He's saying, I'm doing what you're doing. In order to understand how this idea of subversing the liberal order without coming with any other project works, is to ask a very simple question. You know, when uh, uh, basically the Russian uh, occupation of Crimea started and he sent this little green man, 
there was a call to President Putin from a German Chancellor, from other politicians, and he lied that there were no Russian troops in Crimea. And the problem is, why are you lying? This is not a lie that can be denied. The moment when he was telling them that there was no Russian special force in Crimea, because of the world in which we are living, probably uh, Chancellor Merkel knew the names of the Russian soldiers there. But he lied in order to be called a liar. And then he'll say, a liar like you. What about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? So from this point of view, he was trying to build sympathy based on the kind of a real failures uh, of Western policies. This is also true. And this is why something very important did not happen. When the war started, the Ukrainians, but also many in the West, believed that Africans, Asians and others are going to see this as a, what it is. It is a, mm -hmm. a recolonization war. But for these people, it was very much about, no, no, we don't understand it because the real colonizing powers wir fliegen uns ein Stück weit auch die eigenen Fehler um die Ohren. Und jetzt haben Sie mehrere Male schon gesagt, der Westen. Und manchmal reibe ich mir die Augen und weiß nicht mehr, was eigentlich der Westen ist, was Europa ist. Und ich wollte mit Ihnen gerne auf diese Europakarte blicken. Mit wem könnte ich das besser tun als mit Ihnen? Ich muss vielleicht auch einmal noch einwerfen. Sie sind eben Osteuropa-Experte, Sie sind Politologe, Sie sind Philosoph. Sie sind heute in Wien vor allem tätig an einem Institut für die Wissenschaften am Menschen und Sie leiten ein Zentrum für liberale Strategien in Sofia. Und wenn wir gemeinsam diese Karte auffalten, ich habe in der Schule noch gelernt, Russland gehört zu Europa bis zum Ural ungefähr. Das war das, was man in der Prüfung wissen musste. Ähm, ich liebe äh, es, Karten zu studieren und ich liebe es vor allem, es mit Ihnen zu tun. Jetzt machen wir das hier mal auf. Wir sehen hier natürlich Russland, also Moskau. Wir sehen Weißrussland, die Ukraine, auch wieder einmal die Größe der Ukraine ähm, verglichen mit anderen sehr kleinen Ländern. Rumänien, Bulgarien, wo Sie herkommen, ähm, das Baltikum. Und wenn ich Sie jetzt frage, das ist eine Europakarte, gehört für Sie Russland zur Zeit zu Europa? Listen, this is, this is very exactly. Currently, at this moment, with this Russian government, no. But it was part of Europe yesterday and probably is going to be part of Europe tomorrow. And this is the problem of maps. First of all, you're taking a huge risk showing a map to somebody coming from the Balkans because, as you know, we are very much uh, in the business of redrawing the the maps, but also their mental maps. And by the way, this mental maps has been changing. For example, uh, in the beginning, in the Renaissance, the major divide was between South and the North. Uh, and then come the Enlightenment, and uh, there is a famous book about the invention of Eastern Europe, where the major dividing line was between the East and West. And there is a famous joke telling the story of two trains. One train full of uh, Russians goes from Moscow to Paris through Warsaw. And the other, full of Frenchmen, goes from Paris through Warsaw to Moscow. And these two trains basically at one and the same time arrived on the Warsaw station and both have the feeling that they have arrived to their final destinations. Because basically, uh, to the ordinary Russians, Warsaw at the end of the 19th century looked like Paris and for basically French, uh, Warsaw at the same time looked like Moscow. Uh, so from this point of view, in this map, it's not only Russia, the fluidity about which we're talking about anything, is also the fluidity of our mental maps. And these maps are changing. For example, if you're going to, now you're asking me about Russia, but if before the war you were going to ask about Ukraine, there are going to be many people who are going to believe that the Ukraine and Russia, they are not so different. And uh, if one is not part of it, the other is. They're all the time cultural and political choices. In a certain way, nations are deciding where they want to be. Uh, and this is one of the things that is happening. And the real tragedy of Russia today is, in my view, Russia society, in many respects, is more Europeanized than in any part of its history. But now you have a Russian elite and Russian leadership, which basically fears Europe. And fears Europe exactly because he fears that their people are too much attracted mm -hmm. uh, to the way of life in Europe. Die Frage ist ja schlussendlich, ob nicht Putin im Grunde genommen, wir nehmen mal eine EU-Karte, das Ziel hat, Europa deckungsgleich zu machen 
mit der EU, dann wäre natürlich weiterhin die Ukraine nicht Teil Europas. Ist das sein Ansinnen, dass er die Grenze eigentlich hier wie zementieren will und den Westen gleichsetzt mit dem, was die EU ist? Listen, first of all, we don't know uh, what is in his head. And don't forget, what is in his head is changing. He believed that he had a special operations. Now he had a war. And secondly, it very much depends what you have a response. President Putin genuinely believes that the West is in an irreversible crisis. You can agree or disagree with him, but this is what basically drives him. He is reading certain things. And listen, our societies, they have own problems. And depending how you want to read it, you can easily convince yourself that it's not Russia, but America is going to disintegrate tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That basically what is happening is the end of the, uh, uh, of the Western civilization. So from this point of view, when he started, he started very strongly with the assumptions that the West is in a decline and when he's going to start his war, there are not going to be a response. And honestly speaking, the West is giving him reasons to believe this. Uh, now he's in a totally different situation because, strangely enough, a person who legitimately said that Russia is afraid of NATO going close to its borders mm -hmm. ended up with NATO that is going to now have as its members Sweden and Finland, and this means... And, NATO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and do you know what it means? When Sweden and Finland are going to join NATO, the border between NATO and Russia is going to be 1,400 kilometers. So from this point of view, we live on a certain assumptions. By the way, to be absolutely honest, we also have our fantasies. I was uh, seeing recently, just several days ago, the Atlantic Council made this survey among 167 uh, uh, experts in the world, uh, what is going to happen in the next 10 years. And majority of them said Russia is going to disintegrate or basically it's going to become failed state. Listen, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how many times we were seeing Iran disintegrating for this period? But all of us, be Russians or us, are working with a certain assumptions about what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And in my view, the most dramatic thing that is happening to President Putin is that basically he's face a situation in which he had to realize that he didn't understand the world. He didn't understand Ukraine. This is the most important mm -hmm. story. And now the question is to what extent he does understand Russia, because this is a major changes. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, we also didn't understand Ukraine. American intelligence was very precise to say that the war will start, but the American intelligence did not expect that Ukraine is going to give the fight which they're giving now. Mm -hmm. Sie haben vorhin gesagt, Sie würden am liebsten die Landkarte umzeichnen, respektive sei es gefährlich, mit Ihnen über Landkarten zu diskutieren. Ich wage es trotzdem und etwas, was mir ja auch irgendwie Eindruck macht. Eben, Sie kommen eigentlich aus Bulgarien, Sie leben auch zeitweise immer noch in ähm, Sofia. Bulgarien grenzt ans Schwarze Meer, genauso wie Rumänien, genauso wie die Ukraine, genauso wie Russland. Das heißt, Sie teilen eigentlich das Schwarze Meer. Ja. Was macht das mit Ihnen auch? Sie haben Familie, Sie haben Freunde in Bulgarien. Haben Sie auch Angst? No, listen, it is not... Uh, what is interesting is that the borders, uh, the, the maps never die. In the way, basically, you're keeping uh, old books in your library, somewhere in our mind and in the mind of our societies, all the maps are there. And this is why in the moment of crisis, for example, the ghosts of the empires come back, be it Russian, being the Ottoman Empire. And listen, being Bulgarian is one important perspective on the world you know how to see the world from the periphery. And the world looks very different from the periphery. One of the major things that basically now became also clear about the European Union during this war is that the East-West divide is not simply about economy, mm -hmm. this is not about simply the communist legacy, but the countries that started and founded the European Union, all of them have been former imperial powers defeated, like Germany, or by the way, even acting like France in the moment when it happened. Uh, but they took for granted their existence. And then you have all these countries coming from Eastern Europe that came into life uh, as a result of the disintegration of the empires. And most of these countries never can take their existence for granted. Poland, which is a big country and powerful country, in their anthem, they have a line saying, Poland has not perished yet. Mm 
Can you imagine this in a French anthem? <laughs> uh, and this kind of a different historical sensibility, this is when the old map suddenly comes up. And not old maps that you want to basically get this territory or this and that, but history is re-emerging. And it is re-emerging on not on the level of how exactly it was, but very much based on these fears, sensibilities. For example, it's not by accident that the Poles and the Baltic Republics respond totally differently mm -hmm. than to this war than the Italians or the Spaniards. Und ich glaube, das macht sie zu einem so interessanten Experten zurzeit, dass sie eben diese Erfahrung auch haben, was es heißt, eben einmal ein Stück weit nicht zum Westen gehört zu haben oder nur halb zu Europa, weil eben die Frage beispielsweise, wer gehört zu EU, das sagen sie auch immer wieder, die Ränder der EU, die wurden eigentlich immer wieder durch ganz weich gemacht, durchlässig gemacht, hart waren die Regeln, hart waren die Budgets und die wurden von oben diktiert. Ja, yeah. yeah, you, you, you're right, but also do you know what is a certain type of a certain advantage that not only me, but I do believe also my generation feels. We have one experience that West Europeans do not have. And this is the experience how fast things can change. Mm -hmm. Listen, I was 25 in 1989. Sie and haben damals in Sofia. In Sofia, um, yeah. I was in Sofia, I was just graduating philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is critically important is Bulgaria. At the end of the 1980s, communist regime was extremely stable. People didn't like it, but you can imagine that your life is going to go under this. And then over weeks, you can see how quickly it can change. Mm -hmm. You can understand that there is this kind of a power of a moment, and that's something that is taken for granted can disappear overnight. I do believe this experience of the fastness of change is giving one a uh, huge advantage to our generation when somebody is saying this is not possible. We're saying, no, 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 everything is possible. In 1990, the top experts of the American Pentagon were asked by the American government to estimate what are the chances for the disintegration of the Soviet Union. We're talking the end of 1990. 70% of them said Soviet Union is not going to disintegrate because they said, of course, big powers, they have crisis, but they don't commit a suicide. So what is changing in the world is that certain things that you perceived as impossible, just three months later, you see as inevitable. And this kind of experience, this is not that we know it, but you have lived through it. And this is very much changing the way we basically see the world. Uh, from this point of view, when basically the Western experts are going to say, listen, even if the Russians are going to succeed in Ukraine, they'll never go to NATO. Poles, Bolts, who have this experience, they said, how do you know? How do you know? And I do believe this kind of a clash of experiences on the level of countries, historical experiences of nations, on the level of generations, is what is making Europe so interesting, but also so difficult to govern. Because people are coming from a different nightmares and from different dreams. Und interessant ist auch, was hat man aus diesen Träumen gemacht? Weil Sie erzählen auch in Ihren Büchern immer wieder davon, wie viele der Eliten, der Intellektuellen sofort gegangen sind. Viktor Orban ist das beste Beispiel ja. dafür, der 1989 ja. sofort äh, nach Oxford ging für seine Studien. Viele gingen damals und heute sehen wir diesen Brain Drain auch in Russland. Das ist das, was Sie am Anfang gesagt haben, die tiefe Kränkung von Putin, dass ganz viele in den Westen gegangen sind, die klug sind, die etwas anfangen wollen mit ihrem Leben, die man natürlich auch holt. Und das Gleiche in diesen osteuropäischen Ländern. Ärzte und Ärztinnen aus Rumänien, Pflegepersonal, äh, alle irgendwie wollen nach Europa. Ein großes Problem. Trotzki zum Beispiel damals, der hätte ja nie sein Land verlassen. Totally. Listen, this is the most kind of interesting story about the revolution of 1989. Listen, any time when there is a revolution, there is a flow of people who are leaving the country. But normally this is the defeated party. After the French Revolution, it was the aristocratic French who decided to leave the country because they were afraid, because they were losing power. And after the Bolshevik revolutions, it was the whites that left. The interesting story about 1989 was that it was perceived as the revolution of normality. And then suddenly you have two ways to change your life. 
One is basically working in your country, hoping that in 10 or 15 years, your country is going to become like Germany, uh, or simply going to Germany. This was possible. So the first, first people who left were the people who most wanted to live in this West in the way we had been seeing it. But of course, this created the problems of its own. First of all, major depopulation of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. The demographic problem is a real problem. And one of the interesting things that you're seeing in Eastern Europe is that suddenly some of this demographic problem is for the moment uh, reversed because of the Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. Now almost 8% of the people who live in Poland are Ukrainians. And what is interesting enough, and as you know, with every refugee flow you have economic problems, social problems, but you can see how also differently the Poles are reacting to this. Not simply because culturally, of course, they feel closer to the Ukrainians, but also because when we had been leaving our countries and coming back and so on, on one level, and this was very strong in the generation of my parents, they're going to say, oh, it's so great that you go to Vienna. But then what is going to happen to our grandchildren? Is Bulgaria going for them to be their own country? Does it mean that everybody is going to leave and nobody is going to stay? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the old is uh, German joke uh, during basically the last days of Germany, uh, where basically somebody wrote a note uh, to the communist leader Honecker saying, obviously, you're going to be the last to leave the country. Don't forget to switch off the electricity. <laughs> uh, so from, from this point of view, this kind of a movement of people is critically important and keeps something in mind. People had been moving in Europe all the time in one direction or the other. But in 20th century, after the wars and revolutions, we ended up with society that became much more ethnically homogeneous in the East. In 1939, one third of the population of Poland had been not ethnic Poles. There were Germans, there were Jews, there were Ukrainians. In 1989, almost 97% of the population of Poland were Poles. And this expulsion of the population was not done by the East Europeans. It was done by the great powers. It was done by the destruction of the Jews, by the Germans, by the decisions basically to expel, uh, by the, uh, uh, the Germans destroyed the, uh, uh, the Jews and basically after the war the Germans was expelled. What we are seeing these days is very much the opposite process. You have a movement of people and as a result of it societies are becoming more diverse. And this kind of a uh, change of demographic fears on one side, you fear that your people are living. But on the other side now, the Poles feel proud that they decided all these Ukrainians to stand with them. And when Zelensky made this statement, he said, we gave to the Poles the most precious thing that we have, our children and our women to take care of them during the war. Listen, this comes between two countries that even 10 years ago has a lot of tensions, totally different reading of their common history. There is a lot of Ukrainians killing Poles and Poles killing Ukrainians. So from this point of view, the maps are important, but in a certain way, maps are changing all the mm -hmm. time because the real maps is, exist in the minds of all of us. Und diese, dieses Weltbild, sozusagen die Weltkarte, die wir in unseren Gedanken tragen, die wird eben auch immer wieder herausgefordert durch real existierende politische Verschiebungen, aber auch dadurch, wie wir überhaupt auf die Welt blicken. Und ich glaube, es ist jetzt sehr deutlich geworden, dieser Krieg in der Ukraine ist eben nicht einfach ein lokaler Konflikt. Er ist sehr viel größer, er umfasst ganz viel. Und Sie sagen auch, Letztendlich wird es nicht nur an der Wahlurne entschieden, sondern entscheiden wird im Grunde genommen auch, wie stark Europa sein kann, wie sehr sich Europa einen kann mit der Flüchtlingskrise, mit der Krise um die Energie. Und Sie haben ein Bild verwendet, das mir extrem eingeleuchtet hat, nämlich das Bild eines großen Tankers. Und Sie haben die Frage gestellt, wie sinkt ein großer Tanker? Und Ihr Bild war, ein großer Tanker im Meer sinkt nicht wegen des Meers äh, ringsum sondern der große Tanker, der sinkt, weil Wasser eindringt. Und dieses Bild hat mir sehr eingeleuchtet, sich zu fragen, wie entsteht eigentlich Resilienz in Gesellschaften? Wie schaffen wir es in dieser sehr kritischen, fragilen Situation, ich glaube, man muss sie wirklich in aller Deutlichkeit als solche bezeichnen, wie schaffen wir es als Europa, geeint und stark zu reagieren? Und wo dringt wie Wasser ein? Was glauben Sie, was sind denn die größten Wasserquellen, die im Moment die Stabilität Europas unterfluten? 
Listen, the biggest problem that Europe is facing is that first, over this period of a quite prosperous life that Europeans has for a long time, uh, a lot of trust between people and their governments and their elites can be lost. And listen, you cannot blame this on the Russian propaganda or this or that. People in many European countries, while having a different life, suddenly had the feeling that we should fear the future and not be happy to live in it. And by the way, different parts of society for different reasons. You have on one level the younger generation much more thinking in terms of climate and they start asking questions basically what it is about life. Is there going to be life on Earth if we continue to live in the way we're living? But then you have people very much on the right and on the far right who said, okay, what about our way of life? Do I don't have basically the right to preserve the values, the way I see the world? So this world, which is not simply changing, but changing very fast, and people are not all the time aware of how it is changing. This creates this kind of a strong mistrust which makes our societies difficult to govern. Uh, and from this point of view, on one level, the war is the way to consolidate. And you can see it very much, the transformative power of war. Uh, Ukraine is the greatest example of this. Listen, before the war started, if we're going to have this conversation here, and I'm going to ask you what are the three things that you know about Ukraine, you're going to say it's poor, it's corrupt. Uh, and it's not it's functioning like well. And then suddenly, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, and now suddenly, uh, basically you're seeing this uh, Ukrainian flags in all European cities because you saw something that Europe has been lacking and something that Europe has believed that it's not important anymore. You see a readiness to sacrifice for your country. Europe was not simply post-war. Europe was post-heroic. But suddenly you can see to what extent Europe was very much overtaken by a society that was able to be heroic. And even on the level of the leadership, now everybody was talking about President Zelensky, when the war started, his support on the opinion polls was around 25%. And many people were unhappy with what was going on. And there was one phrase, when he was asked by his Western advisors to leave the capital, to go to Lviv, he said, I'm not asking for a lift, I'm asking for ammunition. And this also makes the story that it has structural reasons, yeah. economic. Listen, younger generation has a good reasons to believe that they're going to have tough times. We're living in an aging societies. Young people are becoming a minority in our own societies. They don't have the feeling that even through the ballot boxes, they can put their values or they can put basically their perspective. Uh, but on the other side, you can see the importance of political leaders. Because suddenly, overnight, you can see society transformed. And this is, in a certain way, the best and the worst that the wars are doing. You can understand that society can be transformed, but what you don't know is in what direction. Mm -hmm. And from this point of view, for Europe, it can be opportunity, but nobody can see this for granted. It's going to be difficult. Economically, it's going to be difficult. It's going also to be difficult because uh, the modern world is uh, designed in the way that we cannot live with one crisis for too long time. Remember, just two years ago, we have been talking only about COVID. Now, if you're going to ask me a question about COVID, people will start laughing. Nobody is going to listen to uh, the program till the end. This <laughs> impossibility, basically, to focus on anything, this is also about resilience. Resilience is also to know what is the most important for you, what keeps society together. And this question, what brings... Gesellschaften eigentlich zum Zusammenhalt und wie schaffen wir es, dass dieser Tanker eigentlich auch ein schöner Tanker, wenn wir uns das Projekt Europa noch einmal vor Augen führen, dass der nicht stirbt, dann geht es auch um die Idee des Liberalismus, weil sie schon auch sehr klar sagen, im Grunde genommen ist der Liberalismus bedroht. Das ist eine These, die in diesem Buch das Licht, ja. das erlosch, eine Abrechnung mit Stephen Holmes ähm, herausgearbeitet haben und da habe ich etwas gelernt, was mich schwer beeindruckt hat. Sie zeigen nämlich, finde ich, unglaublich klug auf, dass man mit der These von Francis Fukuyama, das Ende der Geschichte, wir wissen heute, die These stimmte nicht, aber mit dieser These hat man immer eine Siegergeschichte erzählt. Man hat gesagt, der Liberalismus hat gesiegt über den Sozialismus, hat nicht gestimmt. Warum hat es nicht gestimmt? Und das ist diese These, die ich so interessant finde, weil es nie eine Siegergeschichte gab, sondern was es gab, war eine Nachahmungsgeschichte. Und da verweisen sie auf René Girard, den französischen Philosophen, und sagen, 
Es ging nie darum, dass es einen Sieg ja. gab. Es ging, es ging um diese Nachahmungsgeschichte. Der Westen oder ein Teil des Westens ja. hat dem Osten ja. diktiert, wie es läuft. Hat gesagt, ihr könnt mitmachen beim reichen, erfolgreichen Westen, wenn ihr diese Budgets macht, diese Sozialpläne umsetzt, den Neo Neoliberalismus umsetzt und so weiter. Und diese Geschichte geht einher mit ganz vielen Ressentiments, die uns jetzt als Wasser in unser Schiff eindringen. Verstehe ich das so richtig? Totally right. Listen, the most, the biggest paradox, and it was noticed by a German colleague of, uh, of mine, who said, out of the 1989, something that nobody expected, something that basically was surprised to many, we came up with the idea that we know how the future is going to look like. One of the things that happened to the West as a result of the victory in the Cold War is that suddenly the Western intellectuals, the Western journalists, uh, uh, the Western publics had the feeling that we know how the world is doing. We fell in love with our own model because everybody wanted to become like us. But the problem with the imitation is, first of all, people imitate you for different reasons. Quite often people imitate you, not because they want to be like you, but because they want to den Lebensstil oder den Reichtum. destroy you. Aha. <laughs> they want basically, this is very well known in the military uh, situation. Basically one of the things that always the army that lost the war is trying to imitate basically the strategy, uh, uh, the organization of the winning army. But they're not doing this because they're in love with uh, the enemy, but because basically they want the next time to be able to defeat it. So the competitive nature of the imitation was totally lost. And secondly, what was lost is that if I want to become like you, genuinely, and Eastern Europe very much wanted to be like the West, after a certain level you start to say, okay, if I want to be, be like you, first it means that recognize that you're better than me, but secondly, what about me? What my identity? So to a certain extent, many things that people were seeing in Eastern Europe, the rise of illiberalism, kind of resentment, this is very similar to what sociologists have been very well described for the second generation of migrants. The first generation comes, they see the integration in the host society as a success, and then the second generation comes and said, but we are treated as a second class citizens, but we are not getting these. What about our identity? And if you see it, the biographies of most uh, uh, of the, for example, radical terrorists and where they're coming from, this is second generation immigrants. The other thing that is also changing is we're living in a world which is very much kind of uh, brought with the idea of rationality, of transparency, but this is a world that is becoming very uncertain, talking about against what kind of peoples, all these uh, jihadists that went for the suicide bombing. Most of those who had a university education have graduated engineering. Why? Because they go for certainty. And this kind of idea that we want certainty in the world, which cannot be certain anymore, things are changing very quickly. All the time you should ask people how you feel now, <laughs> where you today. <laughs> this is, of course, a major pressure on our societies. And, of course, the relations between East and West are very much changed by this war. For example, if before the West was basically lecturing the East how to live, what to do economically, suddenly the Poles, the Baltics, they go to Germany and France and said, we have been telling you mm -hmm. for years that your policy towards Russia is wrong. You, you're morally responsible for what is happening there. So this kind of a change is a big change, and we are seeing a transformation much more beyond simply the policies, the budgets, the fact that we are going to mm -hmm. buy energy from other places. There is an identity change also of the European mm -hmm. project. Und wenn wir die verschiedenen antiliberalen Strömungen in Europa betrachten, gibt es da wirklich eine Parallele auch jetzt zu Putin? Also was wir ja sehen, ist diese ganze eben beispielsweise Bevölkerungspolitik, die gemacht wird. Also denken wir äh, in Ungarn an die Programme, die Frauen zu animieren, wieder Kinder zu bekommen. Selbstverständlich gäbe es genügend Kinder von Migrantinnen ja. und Migranten, aber die will Orban nicht. Das sind eben nicht die Ungarn, die er ja. will. Er will ein geeintes Volk, um an diesen schwierigen Begriff zu verwenden. Ähm, da gibt es eine Parallele, dann eben die ganze Frage der Genderfluidität zum Beispiel, die Regenbogenfamilien, die ja. Putin ein großer Dorn im Auge sind, aber die ja zum Beispiel auch Donald Trump ein großer Dorn im Auge sind. 
Also sind da Kämpfe im Gang, von denen wir wirklich sagen müssen, das sind antiliberale Strömungen, die wir auf der ganzen Welt sehen? Absolutely. By the way, this is one of the important things which, uh, when we had been starting writing the book, uh, and Russia is very important for our book with Stephen Holmes, and uh, we are always claiming one thing that uh, many people said it's too much. We said, listen, what we see in Russia and Putin's Russia is not host from the past, it's host from the future. Because in a certain way, there are certain things, of course, in the case of Russia, the level of radicalism and exaggeration of these fears and the possibility to do what you want is one thing. But Russia is also facing many of the problems that our societies are facing, as I said. The relations between generations, critically important. Look at the United States, look at also the vulnerability of some of the younger generation. What is now the race uh, and basically the rate of uh, suicide and depression against, strangely enough, the young women, the type of a group that have been empowered by this change. Because one of the other things that is changing very much in the world is that uh, the shift of power is also going not simply from country to country. Basically, you have now more women with the university education in the United States among the younger generation than men. So this loss of power is also becoming loss of identity. And also, if you go back to the history of the Soviet Union, you're going to understand now, also as a result of this war, something very important. Listen, Soviet project preserved the Russian Empire in a way. It was very different, but it preserved. But there was an interesting trade-off. In order for the Russians to run the Soviet Union, they should have an invisible identity. So every other republic has their own Communist Party and their own government. Only Russians didn't have a Russian government within the Soviet Union, and there was no Russian Communist Party. This was the deal. So suddenly, uh, what you see even nowadays in Russia is that radical Russian nationalists starts to envy the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Basically, they want to go to their own nationalism and they want a leader like Zelensky, who is young, who is uncompromising, who basically is saying, we are going to do this and that. And this kind of a transformation is happening everywhere. So from this point of view, it's not that you have Putin and you have Russia and their problem of its own. Uh, and no, he relates, of course, many of the things that he believes resonate with supporters of President Trump, without being the same. And when I listen to you, then I take it also with, it's actually wieder um, um this problem des Verlustes von Identität. Und wie gehen wir damit um, wenn wir noch einmal an den Dampfer denken? Wenn wir dieses Wasser, das eindringt, rauspumpen wollen, dann müssen wir ja eigentlich dieser Identität auch irgendwie entgegenkommen oder etwas zurückgeben, weil was ja passiert, wenn man Menschen die Identität wegnimmt, mhm. es bleibt ein großer Schmerz, es bleibt Wut, es bleibt Ressentiment und das alles ist ein Gebräu, was politisch hoch explosiv ist. Sie leiten ja dieses Zentrum für liberale Strategien in Sofia. Was ist denn eine liberale Strategie, um den Dampfer auf Kurs zu halten? Was können wir tun? Listen, yeah, this is a great story and I agree with you that very much is based and identity is about many things. By the way, identity is also about economic policies. Identity is about social inequalities. Uh, uh, the identity is what has collapsed is first there was a kind of a liberal monopoly and the liberal monopoly was very much based on the idea that everything is a win-win game okay I'm going to win today you're going to win tomorrow but we're in the win-win game people don't believe it anymore but what is remaining out of liberalism and in my view this is very important is the art to live with uncertainty because in my view, this is what modern society is about. And this is going to have a different shapes in different places. Uh, you're not going to impose on people identities. Because what has changed with the modern life, and this is not easy to understand, is that we don't value anymore anything that is our choice, is not our choice. We want to live in the world, we are choosing everything. On one level, this is empowerment. On the other level, listen. This is such a burden. This is the world in which I should feel responsible for every single failure of mine, for everything that went wrong. Uh, in a certain way, you have a man that starts to believe that he's a, like God. This is a different world. And liberalism is allowing people to live with this to the extent that saying, listen, it's fine. It's difficult for you. It's difficult for others. And we should try to live together, uh, basically understanding that we're different and we're going to have different values. Uh, from this point of view, I'm not afraid, and this is why what even, even Ukraine, which now looks so consolidated, listen, in five or ten years, 
you're going to see also the problems there. We have now skyrocketing divorces of some of uh, the women who left uh, uh, their, their husbands who are now fighting in the war. Can you imagine what dramatic experience it is? Mm -hmm. You're staying on the front and basically your family goes in Switzerland and your wife is leaving you. On the other side, the clash is between people that have been fighting the war and the men who didn't. So all societies are going to be divided by different choices. I do believe that the biggest illusion is that we can restore the identities in the way, the way they were. We can like or dislike what we're seeing, but we should kind of learn to live with it. And from this point of view, uh, democracy is not great because it's selecting great leaders and because basically all the liberal politicians are better mm -hmm. than anybody else, but it allows people to fail. Damit, glaube ich, enden wir. Wir können lernen, wieder zu scheitern und wir müssen die Kunst, mit Unsicherheit umzugehen, wieder neu trainieren. Ich danke Ihnen ganz, ganz herzlich für dieses Gespräch, Ivan Krastev. Dankeschön. Thank you. Danke auch euch fürs Interesse. Wer mehr über die ideologischen Hintergründe von Wladimir Putin wissen möchte, hier geht es zu einem Gespräch, das seine Philosophie zu ergründen versucht. Heiß diskutiert wird auch immer wieder die Frage, inwiefern sich der Pazifismus heute noch rechtfertigen lässt. Auch dazu eine Empfehlung. Und falls ihr von den Sternstunden nichts verpassen wollt, abonniert doch den Kanal.